Hello, everyone. I'm Comron. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we'll be discussing Book 4, Chapter 21 of Dead House Gates, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 1 of 1 of our coverage of this chapter. <laughs> this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Comrade and I know that this series is the best fantasy stories ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. So there's not much critique. You're just going to be marveling at this magnificent, amazing, brutal, hateful, and overall gorgeous series of books. And, and man, let's face it. Dan House Gates has lived up to every adjective I just listed and probably about 200 more on top of that, wouldn't you think? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning, today's episode does contain descriptions of extreme violence and it's not recommended for children. Yeah, and if you're emotionally not in a good position, you probably don't want to listen to it yeah, <laughs> until yeah. you can handle some <laughs> troubling stuff. Yes. So do, do we issue the trigger or trigger warning? Trigger yeah. Warning. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if it is, but hey, just in case. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you, and we really mean that. Not like every other podcaster that says, hey, we'd really like to hear from you. We're extremely sincere when we say we'd like to hear from you, so send any feedback or comments that you've got to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, got a challenge for today. Mm -hmm. Get through this episode without breaking down into a sobbing <laughs> mass like my sixth grade teacher did when she was reading Where the Red Fern Grows. <laughs> oh, 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 my Lord, dude. I've never, I've never read that. I've not read a lot of the classics. I've seen them, of course, brought to the screen. But yeah, that stuff is just, oh, my Lord, yeah. I'm traumatized by that. It's like, <laughs> what, why, why don't we do that in America anymore? Why don't we traumatize our youth <laughs> with some of these death stories so they kind of have an understanding of what's going on when it comes around, you know? <laughs> mm. Yeah, that was sixth grade. So probably of the age where you can kind of start understanding that stuff. Yeah. I say it's, that that's from a spoiled perspective. I think in some areas you come to terms with it probably a lot earlier. Oh, yeah. But I'm still, sir. Uh, my heart is a stone for today's episode. <laughs> but yet I weep quietly on the inside. Mm. Not, 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 not a gross, snotty display of emotions. This is just kind of a subtle thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You've always been more contained than me. <laughs> <You know. laughs> All right. Chapter 21. The chapter begins with a quote. Every throne is an arrow, but, end quote. And that was by Kellon Bed. Do you take this to mean the responsibility of every throne is a pain in the butt? I don't know. I, I've taken that to be, is it people like trying to take you out, aiming for your butt? You know, <laughs> you only hold the throne as long as someone doesn't take it from you. I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> I was thinking it's just something you don't want to sit on. I get that. I understand where you're coming. That means more like what he means. Add it to the list. Yeah, add it to the list because <laughs> where is Kellen at? We know where he is, but. <laughs> yeah, but he's got a new throne now. <laughs> he does have a new throne now. Is he driving him mad or was he always that mad? <laughs> to do what he did and take over the Malazan Empire, mm -hmm. form it, and then start those campaigns that they had, there's got to be some level of craziness there. Very ambitious. I would agree. You know what? It's kind of like that Catch-22. Have, have you ever read Catch-22 or know what the Catch-22 is? In I think you've mentioned it before. It's about the pilots yeah. that had yes. to be crazy in Vietnam, but yes. you couldn't be crazy to become a pilot. Yes. Or, so yeah, you, could, you, had, you, you were looking for the Section 8. You were looking to be kicked out because you're crazy. But we needed, yeah, we needed the pilots, so you had to be a crazy to be a pilot. So <laughs> It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to let these fellows go. Don't look over here to this rule. Don't, look, don't worry about that one. <laughs> yeah. We go to Raraku in Shaikh's camp. Shaikh stood on the flat roof of a wooden watchtower near the palace concourse, the scurrying efforts of the army decamping beneath her almost unnoticed as she stared into the opaqueness to the south. The young girl she had adopted kneeled close by, watching her new mother with sharp, steady eyes. The ladder below creaked as someone ascended, Shaikh slowly realized, and as she turned, she saw Hebrick's head and shoulders emerge through the trap. He clambered onto the platform and laid an invisible hand on the girl's head before turning to squint at Shaikh. Hebrick said, Lorik's the one to watch. The other two think they're subtle, but they're anything but. Shaikh turned again to face the south and murmured, Lorik. What is your sense of him? 
Hebrick said, you've knowledge that surpasses mine, lass. Shaik said, nevertheless. Hebrick said, I think he senses the bargain. Shaik asked, bargain? Hebrick moved to stand beside her and leaned his tattooed forearms on the thin wooden railing. He said, the one the goddess made with you, the one that proves that a rebirth did not in truth occur. Shaik asked, did it not, Hebrick? Hebrick said, no, no child chooses to be born. No child has any say in the matter. You had both. Shaik has not been reborn. She has been remade. Lork may well seize on this, believing it to be a gap in your armor. Shaik said, he risks the wrath of the goddess then. Hebrick said, I, and I don't think he's ignorant of that, lass, which is why he needs to be watched carefully. I find it interesting that they're having this conversation in front of the orphan girl. Seems like it would be better to discuss this alone. Uh, yeah, and what's funny, I kind of didn't think about that. Do you think the girl could be a spy for one of those three? At this point, how could they trust anybody there? That's true. Unless there's some unnatural sight Shaikh is providing. This is what I was going to say. Does she have like the truth sense, like the Reverend Mothers or something like that? Nowhere that cool. No way. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. right. Uh, you know what? <laughs> That's not fair. Okay. <laughs> this is the Malazan world. I need to set aside my dislike of Felicin and just say, okay, it's possible. Maybe the whirlwind goddess brings some of that. Right. Right. Yeah, I can't let my dislike of that character cloud my vision. Yes. So it's a possibility that this girl is working for, you know, one of, for one of her commanders of Shaikh's army. But where else do you get to use two apostrophes in, a, in one word other than fantasy? I was trying <laughs> to sure. think of that. I can't think of any examples off the top of my head. I know. It's kind of, uh, yeah, it's kind of limited. There's probably some oh, sure. cities around that have some apostrophes in them. What's funny, I looked this fact up, and you know what it came up with is the biggest contracted word, and it's this, the word you've already talked about, the volcaniosis. <laughs> Are you that was, I thought that was second, wasn't it? No, no, no. That was number one. That's right. Yeah, it, was, it was some guy pronouncing it, and so I watched it. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I listened to him. Oh, yeah. Brilliantly, dude. Oh, he wow. Said, oh, I don't, he goes, I don't see what the big deal is. And he says <laughs> the whole thing. I'm like, vol vol volcanoconiosis. That one, I mean, he said it's the end part you got to worry about on that one. I can't remember the rest of the word because I, I don't have it written in front of me, but I remember super and a bunch of stuff in between super or super volcanoconiosis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that wasn't the one that began with pseudo pseudo, was it? No, no, that was, that was another one. <laughs> that was yet another one. Yeah, that was one of those brilliant. Ones. You found those magnificent words, by the way. Thank you. That was just absolutely <laughs> nice little digression. Yes, yes absolutely. <laughs> they were silent for a time, both staring out into the South's impenetrable shroud. Eventually, Hebert cleared his throat. He said, perhaps with your new gifts, you can answer some questions. Shaikh said, such as? Hebert asked, when did Drajna choose you? Shaikh asked, what do you mean? Hebert said, when did the manipulation begin? Here in Raraku, Skull Cup, or on a distant continent? When did the goddess first cast her gaze upon you, lass? Shaikh said, she never did. Hebrick started. He said, that seems... Shaikh interrupted. Unlikely? Yes, but it is the truth. The journey was mine, and mine alone. You must understand, even goddesses cannot foresee unexpected deaths. Those twists of mortality, decisions taken, paths followed or not followed. Shaikh Elder had the gift of prophecy, but such a gift, when given, is no more than a seed. It grows in the freedom of a human soul. Drajna was greatly disturbed by Shaikh's visions, visions that made no sense, a hint of peril, but nothing certain, nothing at all. Besides, strategy and tactics are anathema to the apocalypse. Hebert grimaced. He said, that doesn't bode well. Shaikh said, wrong. We are free to devise our own. Hebert said, even if the goddess did not guide you, someone or something did. Else Shaikh would never have been given those visions. Shaikh said, now you speak of fate. Argue that with your fellow scholars, Heberick. Not every mystery can be unraveled, much as you believe otherwise. Sorry if that pains you. Heberick said, not half as sorry as I am. But it occurs to me that even mortals are but pieces on a game board. So too are the gods. Shaikh smiled and said, Elemental forces in opposition. Hebrick's brows rose, then he scowled. He said, a quote, a familiar one. Shaikh said, it should be. It's carved into the imperial gate in Unta, after all. Kelonved's own words. As a means to justify the balance of destruction with creation, the expansion of the empire, in all its hungry glory. Hebrick hissed, hood's breath. 
Shaikh asked, Have I sent your mind spinning in other directions, Hebrick? Hebrick said, Aye. Shaikh said, Well, save your breath. The subject of your next treatise. No doubt that handful of obscure old fools will dance in excitement. Hebrick asked, Old fools? Shaikh said, Your fellow scholars, your readers, Hebrick. Hebrick said, Ah. They were silent again for some time, until Hebrick spoke once more. He softly asked, What will you do? Shaikh asked, With what has happened out there? Hebrick said, With what's still happening? Corbolo Dom reaping senseless slaughter in your name. Shaikh said, In the name of the goddess. There was a brittle anger in her own voice. She'd already exchanged sharp words with Leoman on this subject. Hebrick said, Word of the rebirth has probably reached him. Shaikh said, No, it has not. I have sealed Raraku, Hebrick. The storm raised around us can scour flesh from bones. Not even a Talani mass could survive the passage. Wow, a storm even more ferocious than the prior whirlwind? Yeah, I'll agree, wow. Because it was pretty bad before, wasn't it? It was. Was it the storm that was doing that? Remember when they were coming down that cliff? Yeah. Hanging on to Hebrick and uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Hanging on to Hebrick and the, and the skin is being peeled away. I mean, that was the whirlwind, correct? It was, they were going down through it. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So it's gonna, yeah. And she even says it herself. It's, it's even worse. So, and I'm assuming she means to land. I'm as can't pierce it in their dust form. Do you think they couldn't walk through there? Probably not. Wow. That's pretty intense to think that she may be able to stop them. I don't know yeah. why I see that. I see them as some kind of, Almost like it, it's just what we see of them a little bit because of their pursuit of the Jagat, the, I'm sorry, the Jagut. Mm. It, they're so merciless. And what I'm like, they would, I thought they'd be un, you know, it's a place, it's a little sand. <laughs> they're, so <laughs> ele- they're so elemental, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, Maybe like, it's just so ferocious that if they turn into dust, I get that. It would scatter them too far. They couldn't but keep I, it together. I, yeah. I get that. But I was saying, why couldn't they? I, I just figured that they may be able to, like, you know, okay, well, let's just let's all meet at the wall and just walk through. <laughs> mm. Well, they can still take damage. That's so true. I think that maybe if they were assembled, they would probably just get eaten away that's like a true. sandblast. I didn't think about it. I, that's just very, very much like a sandblast. I'm just coming right to that. Yeah. Okay. Hebrick said, Yet you have made an announcement, the whirlwind. Shaikh said, Which has raised in Corbolo Dom doubts and fears. He is very eager to complete the task he's chosen. He's still unfettered, and so is free to answer his obsessions. Hebrick said, and so what will you do? Aye, we can march, but it will take months to reach the Aran Plain, and by then Corbolo will have given Tavora all the justification she needs to deliver a ruthless punishment. The rebellion was bloody, but your sister will make what's already happened seem like a scratch on the backside. Shaikh said, you assume she is my superior, Hebrick, don't you? In tactics. Well, let's think about this for a moment. What do we know about Tavora and what do we know about Felicin? To think Felicin is in any way comparable is a joke. Is the goddess speaking here? Well, here is part of the problem. At this point, we know next to nothing about Tavora. We are informed that she has played soldier, basically, and we're assuming like she's like a type of chess master, I guess is about the best way of looking at that. And she knows mentioned about her knowledge of where everything comes from. So I know she's smart. And Felicity, part of it is because we've been with this one for a long time on our journey through this book. And she's graded on us so much through every bit of her journey. Here in this part, I'm not so bothered by her because it's never really her anymore. I think it's almost like Felicity is gone. Mm -hmm. Because it keeps saying Shaikh and Shaikh and Shaikh. And so it's almost like Felicity has been totally subsumed by this personality, or they're still working out the balance of power internally. So I'm still concerned about this power concern. So all we know about Felicity is she's coming to a lot of power, enough power to shut out the Talani mass, which we understand to be a pretty fierce force of nature and a fair amount of power too. So, um, uh, you know, until we meet this woman, Tavora, we really know next to nothing about her. I went back and looked at all the references that we have so far. And the thing that stuck out to me was in the prologue, when Perrin goes home, Gano is. Yes. He meets Tavora. That's where she's mm-hmm. introduced. There's a comment Perrin makes about Felicin competing with Tavora. Yes. He asked, I think he asked if Tavora was competing with her. And Tavora said that she's she thought. She's a dreamer, right? She says she's too soft for this world or for any world. Oh, there you go. Now, 
that was the old Phyllisian. But when I think of people that are tacticians, they're normally kind of dispassionate and yes. they look at things objectively. Given what we've seen from Phyllisian, I haven't seen any indication that she's any type of tactician. Right, but again, I might be being blinded here because <laughs> this is two times in the same episode. Didn't listen to myself the first time about my bias of Phyllisian. Right. Let's say it's the whirlwind goddess. Most of the gods that we've met so far haven't been the best schemers. No. <laughs> Kelonved is an exception, but he is a relatively recent god, and he was a yes. schemer beforehand, I think. Well, I guess that's what happens, especially when people just ascend. They're still just who they were. You know, it's like, you know, if they were, you know, inept in certain ways, they're still going to be inept in those same ways, even if they're pretty awesome and whatever has helped them ascend. <laughs> mm hmm because that's what they sound like. They, you know, they sound just more like extensions of whatever they were before in a weird way, because they don't really come across as much gods and goddesses to me. They're, you know, they're pretty much like, yeah, you know, they're pretty much just like superpowered humans. It's kind of what they come across as along the way to me, mm -hmm. which, I mean, they are, I mean, <laughs> some of them incredibly superpowered, but I think you're right though. None of them stand out as being schemers. The only people that we know that, that I can think of, they are both on this. I don't know if you would consider them on the same side. You got Kellen Ved slash Amanda slash Shadow Throne and then Quick Ben. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are the two biggest schemers in the book, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> that we've met so far. <laughs> you're right. They're such big examples of schemers too. These guys, they've got that like heist action kind of, you know, they've they got the plans within plans and everything they do. It's like if they go to the restroom, they got a plan within a plan on that one. What is it about Shadow that seems to gather those types of people? Well, because, you know, you think about all the sinister stuff and all that schemes and machinations being done in Shadow versus, you know, there's dark and there's light and then there's Shadow. And so Shadow is kind of like, I guess it's just, just <laughs> maybe slightly more seedy version of dark. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but it draws out all the schemers, though, apparently. Mm. Because uh, think about the other one that we know that's a real schemer. And he, he unfortunately has his penchant for uh, saying his schemes out loud. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's, oh, my gosh, I can't say his name right now. Pussed. Pussed, oh, my word. But that guy's a schemer, too. But, yeah, he keeps blurting it out. But th what's, what what freaks me out about Pussed is maybe that's all part of the plan, too. Mm, you never to know. You need to let me get people off their guard. You know what? Like, he's telling me the plan. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It's like, no, that's the plan. That's the plan. Is that, <laughs> that you think you know the plan. Like, <laughs> Hebrick growled, there's precedent for how far your sister will go in cruelty, lass. Witness you standing here. Shaikh said, and there lies my greatest advantage, old man. Tavora believes she will face a desert witch whom she has never met. Ignorance will not sway her contempt for such a creature. Yet I'm not ignorant of my enemy. A subtle change had come to the distant roar of the whirlwind towering behind them. Shaikh smiled. Hebrick's sense of that change came moments later. He turned and asked, What is happening? Shaikh said, It will not take us months to reach Aaron, Hebrick. Have you not wondered what the whirlwind is? Hebrick's blind eyes widened as he faced that pillar of dust and wind. Shaikh wondered how the man's preternatural senses perceived the phenomenon, but his next words made it clear that whatever he saw was true. He said, by the gods, it's toppling. Shaikh said, Dryjnus Warren, Hebrick, our whirling road to the south. Hebrick asked, Will it take us there in time, fell Shaikh? In time to stop Corbolo Dom's madness? She did not answer, for it was already too late. That's pretty cool that the Spear of Sand topples and becomes a road. Imagine mm -hmm. how tall it must have been if it would stretch from their current location to Aaron. Yeah, that would be so cool on the big screen or the small screen. I would take any version of this almost. <laughs> Do you think it falls and then there's like a big dust cloud that poofs up whenever it lands? Or do you think it's kind of just like a slow 90 degree rotation <laughs> down to the ground? How do you envision this looking? Dude, I don't really know. I, I think we're the former where, you know, it kind of, it kind of, the, it just puffs a little bit. And then it's there's like some weight it has, to it. it. There's some weight to it. But as the dust clears away, it's like, then there's the road. And it's mm. like, whoa, okay. I always pictured it as the tunnel remains. It's just swirling around the road. That's true. Okay. Either way, it's, I don't really know. Who do you see directing it? <laughs> <laughs>
I've got the mm-hmm. combat, the combat sequences, and the big combat sequences. You're going to have a little bit of Zack Snyder for that slow roll here and there that he's always famous for in like 300. You know, all that great combat in 300. Now, it gets a little too much <laughs> with all the slow mo, but sometimes some slow mo is pretty good for some of those action shots. But uh, I don't know who else I've got in my in my brain, man. Tell you what, I'm pretty much into Denise. Whatever, however you say that Denis, name, yeah. Denise, man. I, I, I'm not sure how you say his last name. After watching Dune, I've got all the Dune imagery right in my brain for this. For Any time we're in the desert, my brain always just immediately sub references to Dune. For me, as much as I liked his Dune movies, Sicario is what really cements the style that I like from him. Okay. It is so ominous. I still haven't watched that yet. I gotta watch. Yeah, that. you're just tense the whole movie. Okay. It's so good the, between the music and his slow style of directing because he doesn't do a lot of fast cuts and mm-hmm. he does a lot of good landscape shots that it just really paints a good picture. We go to Aaron. As Duerker rode in through the gates, gauntleted hands reached out to grasp the halter and reins, dragging his mare to a stuttering halt. A smaller hand closed on Duerker's wrist, tugging with something like desperation. He looked down and saw in Nether's face a sickly dread that poured ice into his veins. She pleaded, to the tower, quickly. A strange murmuring was building from Aaron's walls, a sound of darkness that filled the dusty air. Sliding down from the saddle, Duerker felt his heart begin to thunder. Nether's hands pulled him through the crowd of garrison guards and refugees. He felt other hands reach out, touch lightly as if seeking a blessing or conferring one, then slip past. An arched doorway suddenly yawned before him, leading to a gloomy landing with stone steps rising along the inside of the tower wall. The sound from the city walls was building to a roar, a wordless cry of outrage, horror, and anguish. It echoed with mad intent within the tower and rose in timber with each step that Nether and Duerker climbed. On the middle landing, she swept him past the T-shaped arrow slits, edging them both behind a pair of bowmen pressed against the narrow windows, then on, up the worn stairs. Neither archer even so much as noticed them. As they neared the shaft of bright light directly beneath the roof hatch, a quavering voice reached down. There's too many! I can do nothing! No! The gods forgive me! Too many! Too many! Nether ascended the shaft of light, Duerker following. They emerged onto the broad platform. Three figures stood at the outer wall. The one on the left, Duerker recognized as Malik Rel, the advisor he had last seen in Hisar, his silks billowing in the hot wind. The man beside him was probably High Fist Pormqual, tall, wiry, slope shouldered, and wearing clothes that would beggar a king, his pale hands skittering across the top of the battlement like trapped birds. To his right stood a soldier in functional armor, a torque on his left arm denoting his commander's rank. He held his burly arms wrapped around himself, as if trying to crush his own bones. The stress bound within him seemed about to explode. Near the hatch sat Nil, a disarrayed jumble of limbs. The young warlock swung a gray, aged face toward Duerker. Nether swept down to wrap her brother in a fierce hug that she seemed unwilling or unable to relax. The soldiers lining the walls to either side were screaming now, a sound that cut the air like Hood's own scythe. Duerker went to the wall beside the commander. Duerker's hands reached out to grip the sun-baked stone of the Merlin. Following the rapt gaze of the others, he could barely draw breath. Panic surged through him as his eyes took in the scene on the slope of the closest burial mound. Coltane. <clears throat> Above a contracting mass of less than 400 soldiers, three standards waved. The Sevenths, the polished, articulated dog skeleton of the foolish dog clan, the crow's black wings surmounting a bronze disc that flashed in the sunlight. Defiant and proud, the bearers continued to hold them high. If that doesn't make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, then I'm going to venture you are not human. (laughs) For these soldiers to have survived a running battle for 10 miles and more is such a heroic feat. Hard like a stone. Hard like a stone. Sorry. Sorry, I agree. This is truly epic. Truly epic here, dude. Yeah. Mm. Boy, this kind of gets me choked up even seeing Coltane in that crew there. I'm just kind of like, that gum. Yeah. Surrounded and nobody's doing anything about it. But they're there. It's like, how? How? <laughs> the fact that they didn't show it at all until just now yeah. is the best part. Yes. Because nobody had any idea on why it was taking them so long to get to them. Yep. And there it is. There's your answer. <laughs> 
On all sides, pressing in with bestial frenzy, were Corbolo Dom's thousands, a mass of foot soldiers devoid of all discipline, interested only in slaughter. Mounted companies rode past them along both visible edges, surging into the gap between the city's walls and the mound, though not riding close enough to come within bow range from Aaron's archers. Corbolo Dom's own guard, and no doubt the renegade Fist himself, had moved into position atop the mound behind the last one and a platform was being raised, as if to ensure a clear view of the events playing out on the nearer barrow. One madman that we that I obviously left out of the list and a different type of madman is Coltane. How, you know, how could I have overlooked that, dude? Sorry. Sorry. W- w- madman in regards to just tactician? Dude, tactician. Oh, yeah. I mean, in this knowledge. Dude, he, he got to be kind of crazy, too, in a way. I mean, <laughs> to be able to fight, just to be able to fight like that, I'm assuming there's a bit of... And anybody that survived fighting long enough, there's got to be some kind of craziness to them. That's the squirrely crazy. That's the good. It's like bridge burner type of squirrely crazy. I was listening to somebody the other day. They were talking about how to learn things. And he was breaking down the learning methodology of five different types of people. The first type of person is the person that says, no one has proven that it is physically impossible to do this so we can do it. Right. The second person is the one that says other people have done this so i can do it too and then i forget i get the next two mixed up but it's basically like i'll try this but you know you you get uh, lower levels of being able to accomplish things until the fifth one is basically i'm special (laughs) and you're trying to prove how it won't work because you're special (laughs) (laughs) bringing this back to your point coltane is in the first group I feel yeah. like these people that we're talking about that are that are mad men or mad women. It's the people that have a vision and they don't think that there's any bounds to it unless it's physically impossible and they can yeah. do things that the average person doesn't really dream of because they don't see the blockages. Yeah, agreed. And that takes a little bit of craziness <laughs> to pursue and, something like that. So, and the other thing is I'm kind of questioning and I'm assuming that they are lost due to attrition somewhere along the way is the sappers that were those magnificent sappers that were with this bunch. Yes. I mean, cause there were some man, let, their name, there were nameless sappers. That's the way mm-hmm. it's like, is this the average sapper? <laughs> Trying not to be seen. Dude. Staying out from underfoot, invisible <laughs> half the time. But, but they're doing, it's like, they, I, I felt like those guys are doing the lion's share of the lifting you know in a weird way it's like it's unseen unknown and you're like who's doing all this it's like i think those guys were part of the success we're gonna have to say that the sappers were definitely part of the success coltane enjoyed oh yeah when i think of some of the things that they did three big ones that come to mind Mm -hmm. the bridge that they built across the river (laughs) yes right then before the next battle exactly when they dug holes like moles underground and yes. hit under there and they basically charged over their shields and yes. then they stood up and started throwing grenadoes into the crowd <laughs> to disrupt them and then the next one is when they were crossing the river of athar and yes. they got that wagon somehow turned on its side it was stuck in the water they pushed it mm-hmm. turned it on its side to use as cover and then because of them they were able to get ahead and actually hurt some of the archers that were in the trees, which they weren't expecting to have hand-to-hand combat. They thought they were just going to get everybody in the river. Right. Those are all pivotal moments that yeah. were enabled by the things that they did. I read that as completely unscripted and off Coltane's script, you know, basically like, wow. <laughs> or, or were they in the meeting? I mean, I, I, was Coltane behind all that? The idea for creating the road had to have come from Coltane because he uh, knew what was going to happen. Okay. That's my assumption too, because I, because he kept making wanting the, the the captain and the sergeant, which swapped places at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, <laughs> beautiful <sorry>. scene, <laughs> magnificent scene. But you know, those guys, they, I know they were sitting in on the meetings, even though they were pretending not to be sitting in on the meetings. I don't know. I don't know how that worked. I mean, it's like, how did they know to do all that stuff? Oh my word. Magnificent. <laughs> yeah. The distance was not enough to grant mercy to the witnesses on the tower or along the city's wall. Duerker saw Coltane there amidst a knot of Mincer's engineers. That would be the sappers. There we go. There we go. And a handful of Lull's Marines. His round shield, a shattered mess on his left arm. His lone long knife snapped to the length of a short sword in his right hand. His feather cloak glistening as if brushed with tar. 
Dorker saw Commander Bolt guiding the retreat toward the hill's summit. Cattle dogs surged and leapt around the Wiccan veteran like a frantic bodyguard, even as arrows swept through them in waves. Among the creatures, one stood out. Huge, seemingly indomitable, pin-cushioned with arrows, yet fighting on. It's funny the dogs are after the man that was trying to kill him. <laughs> well, he was only trying to kill Roach. Well, true. Right? <laughs> yeah, uh, true. It was just Roach because apparently the annoying yap on that dog. <laughs> You keep reminding me of all these funny scenes. You know, it's a serious moment, Billy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We, I'm, but, I'm, I'm, bol I'm bolstering us, sir. I'm bolstering. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Yeah, because if I just went into the depths of despair, <laughs> you know, it would be a spiral right now. When he lashed out with the lance and the dog took off. Oh, oh magnificent stuff there. The horses were gone. The weasel clan was gone. The foolish dog warriors were but a score in number, surrounding half a dozen old men and horsewives, the very last of a dwindled, cutaway heart. Of the crow, it was clear that Coltane and Bolt were the last. Soldiers of the Seventh, few with any armor left, held themselves in a solid ring around the others. Many of them no longer raised weapons, yet stood their ground even as they were cut to pieces. No quarter was given. Every soldier who fell with wounds was summarily butchered, their helmets torn off, their forearms shattered as they sought to ward off the attacks, their skulls crumpling to multiple blows. It's so brutal. There are only 30 Wiccans left in that group. Along with the children that entered Aaron, think of what a devastating loss this has been for the Malazan Empire. Yeah, a very, a very crushing defeat. They came with quite a few when they got off the boats originally, a significant portion of their tribes. Yes, it was big portions, but man, just think of it. It's never stated how many of them had to have laid down their lives protecting all those citizens. I mean, because remember, they stood there for that 20 hour stand, only lost, like not losing citizens, but mm -hmm. how many soldiers did we lose? How many of those guys did we lose? Just, I'm assuming you hand over fist losses on that, but just to protect the civilians, dude. Yeah. Man. And then seeing the members of the seventh just standing there being cut down without the ability to defend themselves, that's really hard. Dude. I think it's probably one of the hardest parts of this story for me. It's not like I'm merciful, like just a thrust, like, okay, you know, you're dead, I'll just put, you know, pop you in the whatever, but I'm just, we're just going to lay into you like a bunch of savages and just bludgeon you to death as well as hack you to pieces, you know, it's like, ugh. Mm. The stone beneath Duker's hands had gone slick, sticky. Iron lances of pain shot up his arms. He barely noticed. With a wrenching effort, Duker pulled back, reaching out red fingers to grip Pormqual. The garrison commander blocked him, held him back. The high fist saw Duerker flinched away. He screamed, you do not understand. Cannot save them. Too many, too many. Duerker shouted, you can, you bastard. A sortie can drive right to that mound. A cordon, damn you. Pormqual shouted, no, we'll be crushed. I must not. The commander's low growl reached Duerker. You're right, historian, but he won't do it. The high fist won't let us save them. Duerker struggled to free himself of the man's grip, but was pushed back. The commander snapped, for Hood's sake, we've tried, we've all tried. Malik Rell stepped close, said softly, my heart weeps, historian. The high fist cannot be swayed. Mm. This guy right here. I see you, worm tongue. Yeah, yeah. You know what's kind of ironic and that you listed this picture, I don't know if you heard this, but the guy that played the, uh, the old man, he just died on May 5th. Wow. Just this couple of weeks back, he passed. Now, he was a young man, but he was, you know, but he also played the captain on Titanic in the movie, which I've never seen. Mm -hmm. I have no intention of saying, but he was also that fellow. <laughs> in our notes, I posted a picture of Wormtongue whispering in his ear from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I should have <laughs> okay. prefaced it with that, but yeah. Wrapping us back into the Dune references, you know, the guy that played Wormtongue, <laughs> he was the Mentat for the Harkonnens oh, in the original Dune. Dude. That's one of my favorite dudes right there because we've referenced the plan. <laughs> yes. It's one of my favorite quotes from that movie is on my plan. The, on my plan. On the plan. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, it's Brad Dourif, ladies and gentlemen. Brad Dourif. Right. Oh, love that man. For a second when I was reading that you said he died, I thought you meant him. And I was like, oh, oh man. No. no, 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 no. The older fellow that played Theoden. Duerker shouted, this is murder. Malik Rell said, for which Corbolo Dom shall pay, and dearly. Duerker spun around, lurched back to the wall. They were dying. There, almost within reach. No, within a soldier's reach. 
Anguish closed a black fist in Duerker's gut. He thought, I cannot watch, yet I must. He saw fewer than a hundred soldiers still upright, but it had become a slaughter. The only battle that remained was among Corbolo's forces for the chance of delivering fatal blows and raising grisly trophies with triumphant shrieks. The seventh were falling and falling, using naught but flesh and bone to shield their leaders, the ones who had led them across a continent, to die now, almost within the shadow of Aaron's high walls. And on those walls was ranged an army, 10,000 fellow soldiers to witness this, the greatest crime ever committed by a Malazan high fist. I want to take a moment to discuss your thoughts on the situation with Pormqual. Mm -hmm. Leading up to this moment, I've always painted him as a villain due to what's happening here. Right. I, I, I'm the same. I think I have not been too generous in my, I've mentioned him as a piece of crap multiple times because of this, but I'm in a weird way. I'm kind of like you, when you kind of get to him here, I almost have a little pity. It's, is this wrong? I, I, I don't think it is because I think this just goes to Mr. Erickson's writing. I don't pity him and I'll tell you why in a minute, but okay. let me get to this point and then we'll circle back to that. There's a philosophical concept called Hanlon's razor and basically never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. So I always was under the impression, this is my fourth time reading the books, probably should have picked up on this by now, that he was doing this on purpose. Yeah. That he was somehow responsible for never sending anybody because he just didn't want to help Coltane for whatever reason. It's becoming evident to me that this guy is just not competent and able to do his job correctly. He seems to be a bureaucrat that mm -hmm. was put in place with no military experience. And that's why I don't pity him because in that. a meritocracy, you would have somebody with military experience as a high fist. And that's why I don't understand the, well, I guess the, the high ranks are getting corrupted again, you know, under yeah. Dasim Ultor, this would never have happened. <laughs> Was that a test, sir? <laughs> <laughs> and you are correct, sir. But here's a few things. I'm not trying to justify anything. What I am trying to say is how I think that we've been able to achieve this animosity, this level of animosity toward this man, and then have it pulled out from under me to where I do feel it's more ineptitude than anything and stupidity. And in a way, I do feel kind of sorry, but we, he's painted in a negative light almost by one action to me more than anything. And that is the apparent theft and the sending off with the money mm. with all the treasury. Like he's going to get away with that treasury. So I've always thought, okay, this guy's sending the money away so he can leave with it and get the money. Mm -hmm. And that's how I viewed that part of it. So I think that that helps paint him as a villain to me for some reason. And but like you said, you come over here, I don't necessarily pity him, but yeah, you're correct. He, we should have someone with some real, in a meritocracy, we would have someone that was capable here. But I can explain something about that, I think, later on that we'll cover in a bit. But do you think there's a possibility also, we've seen it happen elsewhere in this book where someone has been ensorcelled by somebody. And think of the captain on the ship. Is somebody controlling this fellow, doing something to him? Malik Rell's there whispering in his ear. Mm -hmm. I didn't use worm tongue lightly. Right. Yeah, I don't know how much influence he actually has over him. Yes. It doesn't bode well having someone like that there. Yes, and he has been portrayed already in this book, if I'm not mistaken, as oily. <laughs> if, if I, I mean, so that always paints someone not too nicely either. So, <laughs> Yeah. Part of your point about Pormqual absconding with the treasury, mm. they're just living off the backs of the people. That's true. These bureaucrats getting rich off of the people they're supposed to be governing, using that money to help with the society. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably a lot of my dislike for him comes from that as well. Yes. You know? Yeah. <laughs> bureaucrats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have a dislike for them as well. <laughs> How Coltane had managed to get this far was beyond Duerker's ability to comprehend. He was seeing the end of a battle that must have run without cessation for days, a battle that had ensured the survival of the refugees. He thought, and this is why that dust cloud was so slow to approach. And I can't even begin to imagine what this must have been like. From the moment Duiker left them until now, it's been a running battle for them. While Duiker and them were resting at night yes. and getting help from all these horse wives and then traveling the last three leagues along Aaron Way, these guys were fighting the entire time. Yeah. Dude, that's... 
That's overwhelming. <laughs> what a nightmare. Dude. What what a nightmare and what a what a sacrifice, dude. I mean, that's like a love sacrifice. For they wanted those people to get there so desperately, knowing they needed to buy them time to rest and to buy them time to get over there with those folks and to get to the city, knowing they weren't ever going to make it. We're recording this on Memorial Day. That's true. That is true. Some people take quite, that job very seriously. Quite apropos. Yeah. The last of the seventh vanished beneath swarming bodies. Bolt stood with his back to the standard bearer, a Dobry tulwar in each hand. A mob closed on him and drove lances into the veteran, sticking him as they would a cornered boar. Even then he tried to rise up, slashing out with a tulwar to chop into the leg of a man, who reeled back howling. But the lances stabbed deep, pushed Bolt back, pinned him to the ground. Blades flashed down on him, hacking him to death. The standard bearer left his position, the standard itself propped up between corpses, and leapt forward in a desperate effort to reach his commander. A blade neatly decapitated him, sending his head toppling back to join the bloody jumble at the standard's base. And thus did Corporal List die, having experienced countless mock deaths all those months ago at Hisar. The foolish dog's position vanished beneath a press of bodies, the standard toppling moments later. Bloody scalps were lifted and waved about, the trophy spraying red rain. Surrounded by the last of the engineers and marines, Coltane fought on. His defiance lasted but a moment longer before Corbolo Dom's warriors killed the last defender, then swallowed up Coltane himself, bearing him in their mindless frenzy. A huge arrow-studded cattle dog darted to where Coltane had gone down, but then a lance speared the beast, raising it high. It writhed as it slid down the shaft. And even then, the creature delivered one final death to the enemy, gripping the weapon by tearing out the soldier's throat. Then it, too, was gone. The amount of tragedy in this little segment here is almost too much already. Yeah. Two of our favorite characters in this book, Bolt and List, going down in such a brutal manner is extremely difficult emotionally. Mm -hmm. Especially since they deliver such levity throughout the book. You know, we were talking yeah. about List getting knocked out multiple times, having yes. CTE, Bolt yes. always having good cheer or chewing somebody out, but kind of jokingly yes. and trying to kill the dog. These two brought lightness to so many heavy scenes and then seeing them go down like this just really rips me up. Yeah, it does. It's really tough. And you know what's funny? And I say this in a way, not funny, funny, but ironic. I can take Bolt in a way because Bolt is a campaigner, you know? Mm -hmm. Campaigners die in battle. That's what it does. And he's an old man. So, but List hurts because we watch this guy become a fully fledged, like elite, I would almost consider him. He's he's made it with him. He went with him this far. He survived, man. At least his was, it's, seeing him cut down does hurt, but he, at least he kind of got it easy. He didn't, at least he didn't get bludgeoned and brutally beat down. He got a kind of a swift death. Mm, <laughs> his was yeah. almost m more merciful than Bolt. Bolt is like, I think we've talked about him. He's like the old uncle. I mean, like the old uncle from Braveheart. Is that who you envisage in that? It's the redhead guy's dad. Yeah, the, the dad that gets his hand cut off and yeah. then punches him in the face. <laughs> yeah. That guy? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Love that guy. Yeah, because he goes down like that, doesn't he? Kind of in a similar manner, I think. Yeah, very much. So it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's who I see, too. Yeah. Now, I picture that actor as Dujek One Arm, but the character in the movie, the way he acted, uh, yeah, I agree with you that he's like Bolt. Yeah. The crow standard wavered, leaned to one side, then pitched down, vanishing in the press. Duerker stood unmoving, disbelieving. He thought, Coltane. A high-pitched wail rose behind Duerker. He slowly turned. Nether still held Nil as if he were a babe, but her head was tilted back, raised heavenward, her eyes wide. A shadow swept over them. Crows. Duerker thought, and to Sormo the Elder Warlock, there on the wall of Unta, there came eleven crows, eleven, to take the great man's soul, for no single creature could hold it all. Eleven. The sky above Aaron was filled with crows, a black sea of wings closing from all sides. Man, I tell you what, it gives me the chills every time. Remember when they spoke of Sormo's souls taking 11 crows to carry, it was always communicated with awe. Yeah, religious awe. <laughs> yeah, for just 11. Yeah. Yeah, could you imagine this? I'm assuming we're looking at thousands, if not tens of thousands. Yeah, if the sky is dark, it's thousands. Yeah. 
thousands and thousands. It's almost impossible to think of what this means about the magnitude of Coltane's soul. Yeah. Is this what it looks like to be an ascendant? I guess so. <laughs> I think I, I would guess so. We're seeing something here. <laughs> You know, we know that he broke his hand when he punched Gessler in the face, and it was right. mentioned that Gessler was a near ascendant after going through the fires of Talon to escape the nascent on board the Salonda when they followed that undead dragon out of there. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like you. I think that's what we have to be witnessing. Is, is it a... Yeah, I think between then and now, I think Coltane ascended. Yeah, most assuredly, or is going to, or something. <laughs> Nether's wail grew louder and louder still, as if her own soul was being ripped out through her throat. Shock jolted through Duiker. He thought, it's not done. It's not over. He spun round, saw the cross being raised, saw the still living man nailed to it. Nether screamed, they'll not free him. She was suddenly at Duiker's side and staring out at the barrow. She tore at her hair, clawed at her own scalp until blood streamed down her face. Duiker grasped her wrists, so thin, so childlike in his hands, and pulled them away before she could reach her own eyes. Chemist Rello stood on the platform, Corbolo Dom at his side. Sorcery blossomed, a virulent, wild wave that surged up and crashed against the approaching crows. Black shapes spun and tumbled from the sky. Nether writhed in Duerker's arms and shrieked, No! as she tried to fling herself over the wall. The cloud of crows scattered, reformed, sought to approach once again. Chemist Rello obliterated hundreds more. Nether screamed, Release his soul from the flesh! Release it! Beside them, the garrison commander turned and called to one of his aides in a voice of ice. Get me squint, corporal, now. The aide did not bother darting down the stairs. He simply went to the far wall, leaned out and screamed, squint, up here, damn you. Another wave of sorcery swept more crows from the sky. In silence, they regrouped once again. The roar from Aaron's walls had stilled. Now only silence held the air. Nether had collapsed against Duerker, a child in his arms. Durker could see Nil curled and motionless on the platform near the hatch, either unconscious or dead. He had wet himself, the puddle spreading out around him. Boots thumped on the stairs. The aide said to the commander, He's been helping the refugees, sir. I don't think he has any idea what's going on. Durker turned again to look at the lone figure nailed to the cross. He still lived. They would not let him die would not free his soul, and chemist Rello knew precisely what he was doing, knew the full horror of his crime, as he methodically destroyed the vessels for that soul. On all sides, screaming warriors pressed close, seething on the barrel like insects. Objects started striking the figure on the cross, leaving red stains. Durker thought, pieces of flesh, gods, pieces of flesh, what's left of the army. This was a level of cruelty that left Durker cowering inside. Man, it just keeps getting worse. My blood mm. pressure is going up. <laughs> Agreed. Mm. Agreed. It's, 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 it's maddening. I get so mad. reading. Your, I mean, it's a fiction. And I, I get it. so mad reading this chapter, dude. Yeah. It just, oh, it pisses dude, me off. It does. You know, it's kind of interesting. It's, it reminds me of there's, there's a story about some fellows that heard the story of uh, this barbarian tribe that was introduced to the about to inter a missionary came to tell them about Jesus kind of deal. And when they were told about the crucifixion, these boys were so incensed that they were like, let's go get him. And they didn't realize it had already happened like a long time ago. Mm. <laughs> they were, they were so angry about that, that they wanted to go get him. <laughs> wow. and that's kind of what, when you get mad like that, I'm like, it's like I want to go get, I want to go get Coltrane. It makes me so mad. <laughs> I'm enlisting now. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you don't want you don't want to be in this military, man. Oh no, we'd be, we'd no. Be one, one of the people died. <laughs> please, six months I ago. Would, I, th I think you would have lasted a lot faster. You would have made it longer than me. I think I, would I don't know, Billy. Week out. <laughs> You've at least had some training, sir. It's like <laughs> I'm a big teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> That's me, dude. Duerker heard the commander growl over here. Squint. A figure pushed to Duerker's side. Short, squat, gray-haired. His eyes, buried in a nest of wrinkles, were fixed on the distant figure. He whispered, mercy. The commander demanded, well? Squint said, that's half a thousand paces, Blistig. Blistig said, I know. Squint said, might take more than one shot, sir. Blistig said, then get started, damn you. Squint, wearing a uniform that looked as if it had not been washed or repaired in decades, unslung the long bow from one shoulder. He gathered the string, stepped into the bow's plane, bent it hard over one thigh. 
His limbs shook as he edged the string's loop into its niche. Then he straightened up and studied the arrows in the quiver strapped to his hip. Another wave of sorcery struck the crows. After a long moment, Squint selected an arrow. He said, I'll try for the chest, biggest target, sir, and enough good hits, and that'll do the poor soul. Blistig whispered, another word, Squint, and I'll have your tongue. Squint knocked the arrow and said, clear me some space then. Nether was limp in Duerker's arms as he dragged her back a step. The man's bow, even strung, was as tall as he was. His forearms, as he drew the string back, were like hemp ropes, bundled and twisted and taut. The string brushed his stubble jawline as he completed the draw, then locked it in place with a slow, even exhalation. Duker saw the man tremble suddenly, and his eyes widened, revealing themselves for the first time, black, small marbles in red-streaked nests. Raw fear edged Blistig's voice as he said, Squint. Squint gasped, That's got to be Coltane, sir. You want me to kill Coltane? Blistig shouted, Squint! Nether raised her head and reached out one bloody hand in supplication. She said, Release him, please. Squint studied her a moment. Tears streamed down his face. The trembling stilled. The bow itself had not moved an inch. Duerker hissed, Hood's breath, he thought. He's weeping. He can't aim. The bastard can't aim. The bowstring thrummed. The long shaft cut through the sky. Squint moaned, Oh, gods, too high, too high. It rose, swept through the massed crows, untouched and unwavering, began arcing down. Duerker could have sworn that Coltane looked up then, lifted his gaze to greet that gift, as the iron head impacted his forehead, shattered the bone, sank deep into his brain and killed him instantly. His head snapped back between the spars of wood, then the arrow was through. Mm. The warriors on the barrow's slopes flinched back. The crows shook the air with their eerie cries and plunged down toward the sagging figure on the cross, sweeping over the warriors crowding the slopes. The sorcery that battered at them was shunted aside, scattered by whatever force now rose to join the birds. Duker guessed, Coltane's soul? The cloud descended on Coltane, swallowing him entire and covering the cross itself. At that distance, they were to Duker like flies swarming a piece of flesh. And when they rose, exploding skyward, the war leader of the Crow clan was gone. Duerker staggered, leaned hard against the stone wall. Nether slipped down through his motionless arms, her blood matted hair hiding her face as she curled around his feet. Squint moaned, I killed him. I killed Coltane. Who took that man's life? A broken old soldier of the High Fist's army. He killed Coltane. Oh, Beru, have mercy on my soul. Duerker wrapped Squint in his arms and held him fiercely. The bow clattered on the platform's wooden slats. Duerker felt the man crumpling against him as if his bones had turned to dust, as if centuries stole into him with each ragged breath. Imagine the guilt this guy would have to process. Mm. This whole scene right here is very core, especially the disappearance of Colt Hayden's body. See, yeah, Squint's guilt is, is hard. All this is very hard, but it's, it's also kind of beautiful in a weird way, when, especially with those, especially with uh, Colt Hayden kind of disappearing with that, him like, like you said, his soul, maybe a soul. I think you just answered our question about ascension. Mm. It's not, you know, I think he most assuredly just, we just saw his ascension to whatever that is. I got no earthly, but uh, <laughs> something. Mm -hmm. Commander Blistig gripped Squint by the back of the collar and yanked him upright. He hissed, before the day's through, you bastard, 10,000 soldiers will be voicing your name. Blistig's words shook like a prayer, Squint, like a hood damned prayer. Durker squeezed his eyes shut. It had become a day to hold in his arms broken figures. He thought, but who will hold me? And what a question. Imagine having to be the one to stand strong for everyone else in this situation. What a question indeed. durker has been this way. You know, he's been the stoic and very hard. He's, he's held it all this time. He's going to continue to do so. Duerker opened his eyes, raised his head. High Fist Pormqual's mouth was moving, as if in silent plea for forgiveness. Shock was written on the man's thin, oiled face, and as he met Duerker's gaze, a flash of raw fear. Out on the barrow, Corbolo Dom's army was stirring, like reeds and eddies, a restless, meaningless motion. The aftermath was now upon them. Voices rose, wordless cries, but they were too few to break the dreadful silence and its growing power. The crows were gone. The crossed spars of wood stood empty, rising above the masses with their blood-streaked shafts. 
Overhead, the sky had begun to die. Duerker's gaze returned to Pormqual. The high fist seemed to shrink into Malik Rell's shadow. He shook his head as if to deny the day. Duerker thought, thrice denied high fist. Coltane is dead. They are all dead. Mm. And thus the chapter ends. Tough one. We made it. Made it. Oh, man. For standout moments, Shaikh's spear toppling and turning into a road to carry the army to Aaron swiftly. That was pretty interesting. I didn't see that yeah. coming. And I think you're right. We're seeing it with like the swirling around it sideways, like a tunnel, mm -hmm. because it would have to be to kind of warp. I'm assuming to kind of warp them to they walk. She's bending space, <laughs> bending space time. I always envisioned it as it just reaches from where they are all the way to Aaron. And it's kind of like yeah. a wormhole, if you will, but it's not folding space, you know, they're no, just going no, through it faster. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. It's like, it's like every step is equal to, you know, miles or, you know, if hundreds or thousands of miles, however far it is from there. It's, yeah, it's a long road, but it's just one step gets you down that road and through it or something like that. It's kind of my idea. Right. Finally meeting Pormqual and finding out he's simply an incompetent bureaucrat. Right. You know, it's almost a letdown because I want this guy to be a real jerk or hard headed or something, but he's just a fool, which is tragic and has and leads and has led to tragic results. Yeah. Weak men lead to situations like this. Mm -hmm. The tragedy of Coltane, the Wiccans and the seventh dying so close to Aaron with an army capable of saving them steps away enrages uh, me so. Yes. Oh, it gets me riled up every time, Billy. This is one of the greatest fictional crimes I've ever read. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. I mean, this is almost worse than the other fictional crime in this book that's so bad is that crucifixion of all those children. OK, yeah, yeah. I thought you meant. <laughs> when... Oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm, I, I'm, I, I, that was not me, sir. That was not me. No, that was not me, sir. Good job. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll take that no, one. That's all I've got though, right on that one. But yes, it does. It, it does rile me and make enrages me. But uh, but at the same time, to make you care is what's so. Mister Erickson says, sees that at one thousand percent, man. To get this mad about fictional characters, I mean, it's people you care about. I mean, I almost yeah. see them as people, you know, dude, dude. To see this on screen, oh my god! Imagine unleashing this on the world. Yeah. You talk about the bad stuff that happened in Game of Thrones. And people were getting all pissed off about some stuff. Now, oh my. this is 10 times worse. Dude. Well, 100 how, times dude, worse. Because you actually water, care about the characters. The water cooler talk at the death of Coltane. Oh I, everyone would be so mad. Everyone dude. would be just mad. Dude. <laughs> dude. <laughs> Can you believe? I can't believe that. It's, it's, oh, it's my like, God. I can't believe they killed him. It's, <laughs> Immediately, people would be so pissed. Oh, oh yeah. God. Oh, you would see all the little, what is, it, it, what is it on boys when they always show the social media? It'd be all the frowny faces with all uh -huh. the, steaming, the steaming heads, you know? Poor Squint having to bear the burden of releasing Coltane's soul. I feel, I really feel for that guy. Yeah, this whole section here, this, let's just, I'm sorry, this whole chapter, this yeah. short chapter is core memory from front to end. The betrayal, the crime, because it is a betrayal. <laughs> Yes. Let's face it. It's a betrayal. It's a crime. And then to, you know, all the way through to squint having to, you know, kill this old boy. I mean, that's, it's awful. I mean, these are just all awful choices that have to be faced because of this idiot porn qual's choices. Yeah. Nil and Nether having to watch Coltane die. That's mm. terrible. Really horrific. I mean, she was about to claw her eyes out. I've got an extra R in my horrific description because I, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> horrific <laughs> horrific it just, I, I did not mean to do that it was obviously it's not spelled correct yeah <laughs> and coltane's death you know along with bolt and list and the remaining members of the seventh up there it's just it's almost it, too much to bear yeah it is but but at, at the same time i don't know why i still have this like kind of almost a little hope there with coltane's bodily disappearance after the crows you know that's always stuck you know stuck with me but there's something like i find hopeful about that yeah so for final thoughts i'd like to again thank mr erickson there are very few authors that have made me feel the way i feel after reading this chapter yeah. to be so emotionally involved in these characters is truly a testament to his ability to write worthy characters 
Mm. And this is the reason it's my favorite book in my favorite series. I would have to agree with everything you just said. And I, I would like to take a second here to also agree with Comron and just say, Mr. Erickson, your ability to rip out my heart and make me feel this is it, it is a remarkable gift. I have rarely been touched by authors so deeply as I've been touched and the you know, truly amazing work. You know, as we go through this, I'm assuming that I'm going to feel that every one of these books is going to be my favorite book mm. in this series, you know, for the most part. It's just so, uh, so beautiful though. Just as, like I said, it's, it's tough. It's hard, brutal, and yet beautiful. I mean, how does, how, how does he do it? How do you do it, Ty? Yeah, I don't know. It's mm. a skill. It's a gift. Bad gum. It's one of the, yeah, I think he's one of the greatest writers I've read in the modern times, at least. Yeah. I've read a bunch of other books after having read this and you always come back to it. Yeah. It's funny. Some science fiction guys can get there in some weird ways. Like I, have you read Greg Bear? No. I read his Forge of God. With the, it, he does something that Asimov does to you, which is, it does this wondrous thing also. It, it, it's it's close to this, but not, but it, I, I have Mr. Erickson's science fiction book, not the comic one, but his uh, Rejoice, A Knot to the Heart, which is supposed to be like a hard science fiction book. I, I need, when we're done with this, I need to cleanse my palate and read that in between just to see how good that is, because I'm assuming it's going to be fantastic. I've read Willful Child, the first book, and that's pretty funny. Okay. But yeah, you said you, but you liked it. Too. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. Okay. I don't think it was meant to have the seriousness of, of this. It's more of yes. kind of like a Galaxy Quest style of book, the movie Galaxy Quest, you know, yeah. if that was a book form similar to that. I think he was just taking a break, I'm sure himself. <laughs> You're writing something a little light, uh, you know, get a little light stuff in there. But man, mm. yeah, great episode though. I'm yeah, proud of great you. job I today, I, Billy. I, I don't think you wept openly once. No, I heard you get. I heard you get enraged. Yeah, I got a little choked up at one part, but I managed to power through. Nice. You interrupted me enough to where not interrupted. <laughs> you stopped me enough with digressions to the point where I could keep it together. So thank you, good, sir. Good. You didn't hey, have to pleasure. allow me to publicly <laughs> weep. Hey, <laughs> that's my out job. Of the internet. <laughs> I'm here for that. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. All right. You got anything else before we drop off here? No, just fantastic episode, dude. Hard, yeah. hard, but amazing chapter because big things happened here. Yeah. Good job yeah. tonight. Good job, bro. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. See you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.